West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Uh, in 1845, Frederick Douglass, the great American abolitionist, um, published the first of what would become three autobiographical accounts of his life. Uh, the first one was called Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave. Uh, Frederick Douglass is, of course, one of the greatest Americans of all time. His autobiography is about life as a slave and his struggle to become free. Um, in addition to everything else he did in his life, those written works are some of the most influential written American accounts of anything on any subject. Um, in Narrative of the Life, which is the most widely read of the three of uh, his three autobiographical accounts, um, but also in the subsequent autobiographies he wrote as well, uh, including the next one, My Bondage and My Freedom. One of the most harrowing things Frederick Douglass describes about his own life is a year-long period when the man who owned him as a slave decided that young Frederick Douglass was incorrigible. Douglass's owner decided that Frederick Douglass needed, in effect, to be tamed, to be broken. And so he shipped Frederick Douglass off to a man who is literally known as a slave breaker. Um, the slave breaker was named Edward Covey, C-O-V-E-Y. Um, this is part of how uh, Frederick Douglass describes him in My Bondage and My Freedom. He says, quote, I had now lived with him, meaning his slave owner, nearly nine months, and he had given me a number of severe whippings without any visible improvement in my character or my conduct. Now he was resolved to put me out, as he said, quote, to be broken. There was, in the Bayside, a man named Edward Covey, who enjoyed the execrated reputation of being a first-rate hand at breaking young Negroes. Breaking. Frederick Douglass then goes on in, in chapter after chapter after chapter in this autobiography. Um, look at this, the experiences at Covey's, unusual brutality of Covey, driven back to Covey's. You know, like, Covey's manner of proceeding to whip, right? Goes in chapter after chapter after chapter, he describes this experience, the way that Edward Covey tortured him and beat him nearly to death and worked him nearly to death, all to try to destroy Frederick Douglass's spirit, to try to destroy his mind, to turn him into a docile slave who would work without question, whereupon he would then be returned to his owner. And because Frederick Douglass is so capable and so brilliant, his own recounting in his autobiographies of what happened to him in that period of his life, what happened to him when his slave owner sent him to Edward Covey, what happened to him at Edward Covey's hands, what happened to him while he stayed for a year at Edward Covey's farm and Covey was tasked there with breaking him. Because Frederick Douglass is such a luminous, important, brilliant, inspiring, incredible figure 
unparalleled figure in American history. Because of what we know he is capable of, because we know what his mind was capable of and what he did for his country in his life. When he recounts what happened to him at the hands of Edward Covey, it is the most dispiriting and desolate and just miserable thing that Douglas writes about. He said, I shall never be able to narrate the mental experience through which it was my lot to pass during my stay at Edward Covey's. I was completely wrecked, changed and bewildered, goaded almost to madness at one time and at another reconciling myself to my wretched condition. I suffered bodily as well as mentally, he says. The overwork and the brutal chastisements of which I was the victim, combined with that ever gnawing and soul devouring thought I am a slave, a slave for life, a slave with no rational ground to hope for freedom. It rendered me a living embodiment of mental and physical wretchedness. That was Frederick Douglass's account of of his own life in that lowest period in his own life. And that written account did more than any other (laughs) to galvanize the American abolitionist movement to bring an end to slavery. And of course, it was not fiction. It really happened, and it really happened just as Frederick Douglass said it did. And Edward Covey was a real person who really did operate a slave-breaking operation at his farm, to which Frederick Douglass was sent. Now, if if you go back to that initial description, um, Douglass describes Covey's farm as being on the bay side. What he meant by that was that it, the farm was on the far side of Chesapeake Bay, the far side of Chesapeake Bay from the mainland of Maryland, which is where Douglas was being sent there from. Edward Covey's farm, his slave-breaking operation where he tortured Frederick Douglass and countless others, uh, was this house um, and its surrounding farmland on the eastern shore of Maryland in a town that's now called St. Michael's. Um, the farm and the house at the farm um, itself had a name, a fitting name, It was called Mount Misery. About 15 years ago now, um, a literature professor wrote a very thoughtful piece in the Baltimore Sun newspaper suggesting a new future for Mount Misery, suggesting that the United States of America should consider buying Mount Misery to make it a commemorative site. He argued, would not the most fitting outcome for Mount Misery be as a monument or museum? wherein a key moment from the country's past can find its rightful place in the public memory. The old Edward Covey house deserves our understanding and preservation. The fight between slave and slave breaker that took place there is emblematic of two of the elemental themes of American history, the horrors of legally sanctioned racial violence and also the nobility of the struggle against it. And then uh, here's the actually the kicker from that piece. The professor says, quote, preserving Mount Misery as a public site of contemplation where the meanings of democracy and despotism are given a human face also would help keep St. Michael's from being merely a resort for the wealthy. A resort for the wealthy? Yeah, check this out. Um, The occasion for that call, um, that well-argued piece in the Baltimore Sun that Mount Misery should be purchased and preserved by this country as a monument to the epic violence committed there against slaves in great numbers, but specifically against one of the greatest Americans of all time. The key role that the torture in that house played in turning on our American conscience to eventually overthrow slavery. The occasion for that call to preserve Mount Misery as a monument to the hell that happened there. The reason the Baltimore Sun published that just less than 15 years ago now was this revelation that was published in the New York Times exactly 15 years ago today. On June 30th, 2006, it's titled Weekends with the President's Men. It was kind of a a kicky sidebar piece in the New York Times that was published in the summer of 2006. And that piece revealed that that site on the eastern shore of Maryland, Mount Misery, that house, that farm, had actually been recently purchased and was now being lived in as a private home. Can you imagine, right? I mean, first of all, the house is still called Mount Misery today. That's still the name by which it is known. Who would want to live in a place called Mount Misery? 
But then you get to the reason that it's called Mount Misery, right? It was the home. It was the actual home. It's the same building that's been standing there since 1804. Frederick Douglass was tortured there in 1833 and 1834. It's the same actual physical place in which the great Frederick Douglass was tortured and beaten and worked nearly to death every day for a year. Whether or not you think that place should be purchased by this country and made into a memorial for the worst, most violent evils of slavery and their role in turning on Americans' conscience to end slavery, right? And that's a substantive and interesting proposal. Whether or not you're into that idea, would you want to live there yourself? Would you like to wake up there in the morning and plan breakfast, have that be your home? Who would do that? That article published in the New York Times 15 years ago today, was actually controversial at the time that it was published because in writing that piece, it did reveal the exact home address of a senior government official who in fact had made Mount Misery his private home. His name was Donald Rumsfeld. And he was at the time, summer of 2006, struggling to the end of his disastrous tenure as Secretary of Defense under the George W. Bush administration. He lived at the time at Mount Misery. He bought the place in 2003 as he was leading the nation into the invasion of Iraq. That was where he went to get away from Washington while running two disastrous wars. He liked to have the Chinook helicopter drop him off at the slave breakers home where Frederick Douglass was nearly tortured to death. He could really relax there. It is Thursday, the 1st of July of 2021, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef, and our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays, a little bit of jambalaya. A little bit of spice in your life. Well, uh, ding dong, Donald Rumsfeld is dead. Uh, you know, I uh, I never met the guy. I I used to think that uh, Edward Teller, whom I would accost on a regular basis at the Pete's right by the Claremont Resort Hotel there in Berkeley, Oakland. Yes, I would accost him at the Pete's right there. Uh, Almost daily, <laughs> for a decade or more, I used to think that he was a soulless ghoul. And from everything that I've heard about interpersonal relationships with Donald Rumsfeld, um, he was a cold, heartless, without... Yeah, yeah he's just... He's, he's scary. Let's just put it that way. And uh, so now he's passed on to the great beyond. Uh, he's not going to the pearly gates to be judged with a quick and the dead. Let's just put it that way. Okay. He's got a one way ticket and it ain't up there, wherever up there is. But um, yeah, he's uh, splitting rocks and uh, I guess that uh, he's going to be in his own uh, personal Mount Misery Guantanamo for the rest of forever. Mm hmm. And that's a really long time, I gotta tell you. So, uh, good riddance. Um, I, I, I know we're not supposed to speak ill of the dead, but, uh, you know, the memory of Donald Rumsfeld lives on, so we might as well just, you know, speak ill of it. Because uh, a lot of what we are experiencing now was brought to the fore by Donald Rumsfeld. Yeah, lying about the big consequential things. He was a master at that. Everybody knows that. And he was a master at that back during Nixon, too. It's just that there was so much going on. Liddy. <laughs> Mitchell. You know, the big names. In other news, Bill Cosby got off. Uh-huh. They let him out. I don't know how that works. Some guy, a corrupt prosecutor, a corrupt DA. And, uh, yeah, we're looking at you, Mr. Oily Caster. See what I did there? Yeah, he'll clean you out. <laughs> anyway, he was Trump's one of Trump's impeachment lawyers and, you know, the, the crazy one. <laughs> so this guy out of the blue says, hey, I made I made a deal. With Bill Cosby, that if he spilled the goods in a civil suit where he'd lose lots of money, uh, he could never be tried criminally for this. Okay, 
Well, why doesn't anybody else know that? Why didn't the court know that? Why wasn't it written down? Why did three other courts find no evidence that there was a deal when approached with the idea? Uh Uh-huh. I want to know about the Pennsylvania Supreme Court because I vaguely remember a shakeup in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court pushed through by Republicans. So I'm curious on how that works. Does Bill Cosby have that much money and influence? Does he? Well, as they said in uh, another tri- in another trial long, long ago, if the glove fits, if the glove doesn't fit, you must acquit. So, uh, and I guess they did because they found a way of letting him off on a technicality. Now we know that he is a serial rapist. And who was allowed to testify to that is another travesty. Jeez. Well, what do you expect from a Federalist Society judge ruled uh, judge, federal judge and judiciary? Yeah, there, there, there. I got it out. Okay, well, so much more going on in the world. Uh, Oh, I wanted to say thank you to those who did reach out and uh, uh, expressed concern and gave me get well wishes because of this uh, bacterial infection uh, arising again. That's wow. I thought I thought the Cipro killed it all, but apparently not. They lay dormant and then come alive somehow. I, I, I that's what I'm surmising. So I guess I should try to figure out how to take care of that. Does one go get antibiotics? I guess I should talk to my doctor. Well, I will. Anyway, thank you for uh, reaching out and uh, extending good wishes. Uh, That was very thoughtful of you. Okay, so why don't we give the rundown about what we have curated for you today on this fine Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays. At the top, uh uh-huh. Donald Rumsfeld. That Donald Rumsfeld. Who would do that? Who would take the plantation and make it their personal getaway home? Yes, my pet. And this is the guy that said Guantanamo is outside. Uh, It's extrajudicial. We can do anything we want there. Anything. And John, you said it was okay, too. You know, and and he's a lawyer, so lawyers know whatever a lawyer says. Oh, yeah, torture him. You can do anything you want. So where did Donald Rumsfeld go to relax? Mount Misery. Now, if that isn't a poke in the eye to, well, every uh, uh, descendant of uh, an American black slave, I would think. Frederick Douglass famously wrote about being nearly tortured to death at Mount Misery at the hands of Edward Covey. So where does Donald Rumsfeld go to relax? Mount Misery. Well, I have a vision of uh, hell for Don. Yeah. And it actually incorporates uh, his own personal Mount Misery, as I alluded to earlier. Except in this one, he's uh, being beat with an armory full of a cat of nine tails made from colorful snakes. Live colorful snakes. And he's being whipped with these cat of nine tails of colorful snakes by troops of Edward Covey's. Forever and ever and ever. Then, on the rest of the menu, a mostly white California high school was stripped of its basketball division title and its coach fired after a racist tortilla-throwing incident. You can imagine. And now we have to. As wildfires rage, President Biden is temporarily raising pay for federal firefighters to ensure that no one fighting wildland fires is making less than 15 bucks an hour. Oh, wow. They paid them less? Yeah, some some of them were not making minimum wage. That's crazy. 
And San Jose, California passed the first law in the nation that requires gun owners to carry liability insurance. And it's about time. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Turkey formally quit the international treaty to prevent violence against women. Well, that's really advanced. And Vladimir Putin said Russia could have sunk the UK warship HMS Defender in the Black Sea without starting World War Three. Oh, tell me how. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Radio.com. To the right of the page is our chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Hey, you had some weather out there, didn't you? We'll get to that in a bit. If you would then look across the page near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will then hopefully uh, find our link to our Patreon page because it's right there. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, and if you could afford an espresso type coffee drink and send those funds, Once a month our way, we are able to stretch those dollars with dollars that we pull out of our own wallets. And then we pay our bills. We fly under the radar because that technology is still being used. And uh, then we continue this resistance against this Nazi takeover of America. And who knew that was going to happen so extensively as it is right now? And we have... Uh, we, we thank you for your generosity, all kidding aside, because we would truly be unable to do it without you. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, do so at Netroots Radio. Thank you, Tom, for taking care of that. Follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. I post the show notes and links diary. Diary, not a story. It's a diary. On Daily Co's about... 10 minutes before showtime and then get that posted up on Twitter and other social media platforms. And you know who they are. Follow the show on Twitter at cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, and wherever podcasts can be found. Okay. You know, my, uh, my wrist still is achy. I don't want to, I, I, is this climate change? Because if it is, can I sue Exxon? Because, you know, we were talking about this way back in the day, right when they were, too. And everybody wondered, would a major oil company put out these really uh, saccharine, lovely commercials about how they're doing so much for the environment just so they could greenwash what they're doing, uh, at least in terms of propaganda, because they weren't really making islands of tranquility with all of their uh, their largesse. Uh, to hide the fact that they were actually destroying the earth so it would be burned to a crisp? Yes, a major oil company and the rest of them would. Boy, from hiding the fact that lead in gasoline was going to kill people in a terrible way, and before they got killed, they would, well, it's interesting to note that when lead was taken out of our petrol, crime rates went down. Because one of the effects of lead poisoning is uh, certain impulsive activities that are usually controlled in certain parts of the brain. And those uh, triggers were or or gateways were uh, destroyed and then people could moderate their behavior because they were environmentally poisoned. And their own scientists knew that, voiced it, and uh, those scientists, you know, were usually pushed out. Okay. Well, where do we go now? <laughs> it's burning up. So is my uh, uh, resurgence of cellulitis because of climate change? Can I sue somebody? Man, 
I thought this was America. I thought you, you know, everybody gets to sue at one point. I've never sued anybody. <sighs> okay, we're a litigious society. We don't all, we all have to do it, do we? Speaking of litigation, this one actually deserves it. This uh, first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes from the Associated Press by staff at the Associated Press. The governing body for high school sports in California stripped a Southern California high school of its basketball division championship after some of its players threw tortillas at the opposing team which was from a largely Latino school. You know, we're seeing all sorts of this, you know. Uh, four years of having a racist demagogue at the top, demonizing everything that was of color. Yeah, I guess that's going to happen, huh? Coronado High School will lose its boys' Division 4A regional championship because of the, quote, degrading and demeaning behavior, end quote following the June 19 division championship game, according to a statement from the CIF. And that's affectionately known for those who know as the California Interscholastic Federation. At least two students from mostly white Coronado High School were captured on video throwing tortillas into the air toward the other team after a 60-57 victory over Orange Glen High School in Escondido. The incident followed a squabble between co coaching staff from both schools. It received national attention and prompted several investigations. The Coronado Unified School Board voted unanimously to fire coach J.D. LaPerry following the incident. Remember that name. Is he going to go coach somewhere else? And District Superintendent Carl Mueller issued a public apology. A Coronado High alumnus who provided the tortillas to players said throwing them was a tradition at a college he attended. The University of California, Santa Barbara. Oh, really? Luke Cerna said he is of half Mexican descent, and so that makes it okay. And that there was absolutely no racial intent behind that action. Sure. But the California Interscholastic Federation statement said its state executive director reiterates that discriminatory and racially insensitive behaviors toward an opponent contravene the principles of education-based athletics. In this instance, there is no doubt the act of throwing tortillas at a predominantly Latino team is unacceptable and warrants sanctions, the statement said. Mueller said on Wednesday yesterday the school is reviewing the Federation sanctions and will decide whether to appeal them. We have also retained an outside investigator to thoroughly review the incident, which will guide any additional corrective actions, Mueller's statement said. In addition to vacating the regional championship, the governing board placed Coronado High on probation for the next three school years and said the school's boys basketball team cannot host postseason contests at sectional, regional, or state level through the 2022-23 school years. For all other school sports, administrators, oh, I'm sorry, for all other, other school sports teams, administrators, athletes, coaches, and athletic directors must take a sportsmanship workshop before being allowed to post postseason contests. The workshop must include racial and cultural sensitivity training, and school administrators and athletic directors must undergo game management training. Offering in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays is by staff of the Associated Press. 
President Joe Biden is temporarily raising pay for federal firefighters to ensure that no one fighting wildland fire fires is making less than $15 per hour. Biden's plan for the higher pay and other moves to boost wildfire fighting capacity and prevention efforts came as he held a virtual meeting yesterday, Wednesday, with governors from western states to discuss what is shaping up to be a torrid wildfire season. In addition, a huge swath of the Pacific Northwest is in the midst of one of the worst heat waves in recent memory. Biden has expressed dismay at the starting pay for federal firefighters, which is significantly lower than many local and state fire agencies. Pay for new federal firefighters typically starts at 11 to $14 per hour, and there are overtime eligible uh, and they are overtime eligible, according to the Interior Department. That's going to end in my administration, Biden said. During a visit last week to uh, FEMA at FEMA for a briefing on natural disaster prevention efforts, this is a ridiculously low salary for federal firefighters. Well, that's true, isn't it? Western states have been parched by severe drought and record heat that has burned more than 2,000 square miles this year. That's ahead of the pace in 2020, which saw a near record 15,000 square miles burned, as well as more than 17,000 homes and other structures destroyed. of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy comes from the Associated Press by even more anonymous staff. San Jose officials have passed the first law in the nation that requires gun owners to carry liability insurance and to pay a fee to cover taxpayer costs associated with gun violence. The new law was unanimously approved by the city council a month after a disgruntled San Jose rail yard employee fatally shot nine of his co-workers and then himself at the rail yard. Mayor Sam Licardo praised the measures and said gun owners who do not comply with the new rules should not have guns. We won't magically end gun violence, but we stop paying for it, Licardo said in a statement. The new law is part of a 10-point gun control plan that that Licardo unveiled following the May 26 mass shooting at the Santa Clara Valley Transportation Authority rail yard. Officials have not decided how much gun owners will be required to pay in fees. They would be used to cover the direct costs of gun violence to city taxpayers for services that include police response, ambulance transport, and gunshot-related medical treatment for victims. The fees would be determined upon completion of a gun harm study from the Pacific Institute on Research and Evaluation, a group that promotes individual and public health welfare and safety. In a preliminary report released ahead of the vote, the Institute estimated that gun-related homicides, suicides, and other shootings cost San Jose around $63 million a year. A more thorough study is expected to be completed in the fall. The Brady United Against Gun Violence, uh, the national nonprofit that advocates against gun violence, said there have been other similar, similar laws proposed, but San Jose is the first city in the country to have passed one. One challenge to enforce the law will be determining how to administer the new liability insurance and fee requirements. City officials know how many guns were purchased in San Jose since 2001, Licardo said, but the city has no gun registry and no way to track gun owners. Earlier this month, 
Lawmakers passed a new law requiring all retailers to record video and audio of all firearm purchases. San Jose became the largest California city with such a rule. Well, that brings us to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Scientific American, 60 Second Science. I'm Maddie Bender. Take a walk in the woods after dark, and you might hear crickets chirping or frogs ribbiting. But there's a sound you'll never hear. Unless you're traveling across the equator in the center of Africa, from Liberia to Uganda. This is the call of the tree hyrax, a small furry mammal that looks like a cross between a groundhog and a ground squirrel, minus the bushy tail. John Oates, a professor emeritus of anthropology at Hunter College, says hyrax calls are like none other. The most characteristic sound of the majority of tree hyrax populations across the rainforest zone of Africa is a, a, a loud, repetitive a shrieking or screaming cry that you only hear at night, which reverberates through the forest. And if you've never heard it before at first, it's quite scary. Each species of tree hyrax has its own unique call. Due to their distinctive shrieks, oats and an international team of researchers discovered a new species of the mammal. In 2009, Oates was on an expedition across Nigeria in search of Galagos, also known as bush babies. Here's a hyrax call like the ones Oates and his colleagues heard in eastern Nigeria. Just be warned, it sounds a lot like a human scream. But then, when they got to western Nigeria, they heard this at night instead. Oates says they knew instantly that they had a new species on their hands. Hearing the two calls in such close proximity in time, one could immediately tell the difference. They just had to prove it. Oates and colleagues analyzed the skulls of tree hyraxes from six museum collections. They found that the hyraxes sampled from between the Volta River in eastern Ghana and the Niger River in western Nigeria had differently shaped snouts and inner nostrils from the species of hyraxes to their east and west. Scientists have looked at these before, but just never happened to notice it. They weren't looking for differences. They seemed to be looking for similarities because everybody accepted that all these hyraxes were the same. Next, they sent off samples of hyraxes, mostly collected from bushmeat markets, to have their DNA sequenced. Results from this analysis confirmed their theory. The hyraxes living between those two rivers were genetically distinct. All that remained was to observe this new species in the wild. Oates says he and his team worked with local villagers to place camera traps strategically. Following up on something some villagers told us, they said, those animals you're talking about, they live in those, uh, in those rocks. Well, tree hyraxes are supposed to sleep in trees, so here was another intriguing thing. They captured footage of the mammals running around and named the new species after the area in which they were found, interfluvialis, or between two rivers. The discovery was published in the Zoological Journal of the Linnaean Society. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. 
I'm your host, Dr. Kathleen Dooling. From a very young age, we're encouraged to eat fruits and vegetables. Unfortunately, many Americans are not getting the message. Dr. Sung Hee Lee Kwan is with CDC's National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. She's joining us today to discuss the importance of eating enough fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the show, Sung Hee. Thank you for having me. Sung Hee, what is the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables? The federal guidelines recommend that adults consume at least one and a half cups to two cups of fruit and two to three cups of vegetables each day. This is for adults who get less than 30 minutes of physical activity a day. Adults who are more physically active need more calories and thus should be eating more fruits and vegetables. One cup is about 12 strawberries or one large tomato. How many people consume the recommended amount of fruits and vegetables? We found that very few adults are getting enough fruits and vegetables. Just 12% are eating the recommended amount of fruits, and less than 1 in 10 eat enough vegetables. And consumption is lower among men, young adults, and adults living in poverty. Why is eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables so important? Eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables can help with three things. One, it can reduce the risk of many leading causes of illness and deaths, such as heart disease, type 2 diabetes, some cancers, and even obesity. It can also add important nutrients that are commonly missing in Americans' diet. And it can help with weight management if adults consume fruits and vegetables instead of other calorie-dense foods. How can we meet the recommended daily intake of fruits and vegetables? Try to fill half of your plate with fruits or vegetables at each meal or every eating occasion. Making fruits and vegetables the focal point of your meal will help you meet your recommendations. For example, recent studies have shown that adults get most of their fruit during breakfast and snacks. So you can try adding berries to your morning oatmeal or grab a piece of fresh fruit as an afternoon snack. For vegetables, most adults eat them at dinner, so try adding more into your lunch by adding a side salad or packing a snack of baby carrots or grape tomatoes. Are canned or frozen products just as good as fresh? All forms of fruits and vegetables count towards meeting the recommendations. For the most health benefits, make sure that the fruits and vegetables you consume have a limited amount of salt, butter, sugar, or creamy sauces. When selecting canned fruits, choose the ones with lowest sugars. And for canned or frozen vegetables, choose those lower in sodium. Where can listeners get more information about eating a healthy diet? Listeners can go to cdc.gov slash nutrition or choosemyplate.gov. Thanks, Sunghee. I've been talking today with Sunghee Lee Kwan about the importance of eating a healthy diet. Eating a diet rich in fruits and vegetables can help reduce the risk of many leading causes of illness and death and add important nutrients to your diet. Make sure you're eating enough. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Kathleen Dooling for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. Either side of its range provided a geographic barrier where the mammals could have evolved undisturbed. Oates says his collaborators are working on identifying more species unique to this region with the hope of making a stronger case for its conservation. There's a lot more to this thing than just this poor little rabbit or marmot or groundhog like animal that makes strange noises in the middle of the night. That area has one of the most dense human populations in Africa and where there's been a great deal of economic development, all leading to forest habitats being destroyed at an alarming rate. Some of us have been involved, therefore, for some time in trying to hold on to what remnants we can, get them declared as national parks, wildlife reserves, community conservation areas so that both the vegetation and these special animals have a chance of surviving. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Maddie Bender. A social distancing tip. 
While the CDC urges you to avoid close contact, like hugging or shaking hands, there are other non-physical ways to say hello. Wave, wink, use sign language, salute, smile, give the peace sign, throw up an air high five, do jazz hands. Remember, stay a minimum of six feet or two arms length away from others and stay home if you can. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Hi, it's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to netrootsradio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. And it doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our netrootsradio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our netrootsradio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. Netrootsradio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. Can a high school punish a student for criticizing the school on Snapchat? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. At a high school in Pennsylvania, a ninth grader, identified in the recent Supreme Court decision as BL, didn't make the varsity cheerleading squad and, in the words of the court, did not accept that decision with good grace. More specifically, BL posted to her Snapchat friends group an image of herself and a friend giving a middle finger salute with the caption, F*** school, F*** softball, F*** cheer, F*** everything. The image was brought to the attention of the school authorities who punished her, suspending her from the JV cheerleading squad for a year. The student apologized, but to no avail. The punishment stood until the student sued in federal district court and won and won at the Court of Appeals and at the end of June won her freedom of speech case at the Supreme Court as well. The high court ruled that the school's interest in teaching good manners did not overcome the student's interest in free expression, emphasizing that the speech caused minimal disruption to teaching, learning, and school activities, and that the school has an important interest in protecting a student's unpopular expression, especially when the expression takes place off campus. The 8-to-1 majority opinion, written by Justice Breyer, intentionally does not answer all the questions of when off-campus speech might not be protected, but made clear that in this instance, It clearly was a good and clear victory for freedom of speech. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU because freedom can't protect itself. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1929. That was the day 1,800 streetcar drivers and motormen walked off the job at New Orleans Public Service. The Amalgamated Association of Street and Electric Railway Employees, Division 194, had been in contract negotiations for months. They demanded higher wages, a closed shop, and an end to arbitrary discharges. The company was looking to bust the Amalgamated with the creation of a company union. For the first few days, the strike was quiet. But then, on July 5th, the company brought in strike breakers. 10,000 union members and their supporters gathered to stop scab service. The company attempted to run a lone streetcar down Canal Street. Immediately, it was pelted with bricks and stones. The scab driver bailed. Another four cars attempted to leave the car barn. Pitched battles raged for hours with police and scabs. Two union men were shot and killed by scabs and hundreds more injured. Trade unions throughout the city threatened a general strike. The strike raged on for two months. Throughout the summer, trolleys were burned to the ground, tracks destroyed, switches cemented in place. As the weeks wore on, conditions became more desperate. That's when Clovis and Beanie Martin, former Division 194 conductors, decided to help out. They had since left public transit to open the Martin Brothers coffee stand and restaurant. They declared to their former union brothers, quote, We are with you, heart and soul. We are with you till hell freezes over. They offered free supersized sandwiches for the poor boys. The strikers would eventually win some of their demands. The sandwiches would become a standard in New Orleans cuisine, better known as the Poe Boy. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Labor History in 2.
Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America. Where it is currently 65 degrees Fahrenheit, still under an active heat advisory, though our uh, daytime temps are forecast to be a bit cooler than yesterday, I hope so, because it was supposed to be cooler than the day before, and it was only moderately cooler by a degree or two, because we got to 102, 103 yesterday here at the mothership in Rogue River. I know our microclimates are a bit different than the others that are the official measurements, but this little weather station here still has it, and the weather station nearby still is uh, registering some pretty hot temps during the day. Anyway, we're supposed to be only 94 today. Only 94. And I have to tell you, it actually feels quite good between 114 and a 94. Sunny throughout the day, winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour, clear skies overnight with a pleasant lows in the 60, low 60s, around 63, which is what we had last night, and it was lovely. And we still are experiencing that loveliness. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Sunny tomorrow with a high near 98, which means it'll be about 103 here at the mothership. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Confirmed cases of coronavirus continue to increase even though we have no more mask mandates. All protocols are gone. Go ahead, get everybody sick. So we are now ha- we have now increased to 116,041 and we've also added one more confirmed death by coronavirus which now is at 148 for Jackson County in the southern part of Oregon. Okay, fine. Grass pollen remains high right here in Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is good at 32 parts per million, so there's something to be happy about. And that daytime UV index remains very high at 9, so do take care. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 29.95 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. And relative humidity is at 72%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that's known as the Weather Underground. Yes, we are. London is 68 and partly cloudy. Paris is 72 and cloudy. Rome is 85 and partly cloudy. Kiev is 86 and fair. Are we calling it Kiev still or is it Kiev? Because I don't know. These guys are kind of getting on my nerves. Anyway, they're 86 and fair. Kabul is 82, fair with a lot of wind, and you know how that goes. Hong Kong is 81 and mostly cloudy and mostly authoritarian already. Tokyo is 70 degrees and cloudy. Sydney, Australia is 56 with showers in the vicinity. San Francisco, California is 56 and cloudy. And New York, New York is 82 degrees Fahrenheit, partly cloudy. And are you going to get some more rain? And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. Jesse Tuxabe and Darren Butler of Reuters brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. President Erdogan defended Turkey's withdrawal from an international treaty to prevent violence against women, a move that has drawn condemnation from many Turks and Western allies. The Istanbul Convention, negotiated in Turkey's biggest city and signed in 2011, committed its signatories to prevent and prosecute domestic violence and promote equality. 
Erdogan announced the withdrawal in March in favor of local laws to protect women's rights. Thousands were set uh, to protest the decision today across Turkey, where femicide has surged. A court appeal to halt the withdrawal was rejected this week. Some circles are trying to portray our withdrawal from the Istanbul Convention as a step backwards in our battle with violence against women, he said during a speech in Ankara to present an alternative action plan. Our battle did not start with the Istanbul Convention, and it will not end with our withdrawal from the treaty, he said. I guess what he's talking about is defending the wife beaters. Ankara's withdrawal triggered condemnation from both the U.S. and the EU, and critics say it puts Turkey even further out of step with the bloc that it applied to join in 1987. Three opposition parties also pulled out of a parliamentary commission to protest the decision. One monitoring group has logged roughly one femicide per day in Turkey since a sharp rise five years ago. Proponents of the convention and related legislation say more stringent implementation is needed, but many conservatives in Turkey and in Erdogan's Islamist-rooted AK party say the pact undermines the family structures that protect society. Oh, really? Some also see the convention as promoting homosexuality through its principle of non-discrimination on grounds of sexual orientation. Ditching the pact will not lead to any legal or practical shortcoming in the prevention of violence against women, Erdogan's office said. And this month, Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights sent a letter to Turkey's interior and justice ministers expressing concern about a rise in homophobic narratives by some officials, which some of which targeted the convention. All the measures provided by, for by the Istanbul Convention reinforce family foundations and links by preventing and combating the main cause of destructions of families, and that is violence. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles Rester toujours fidèle C'est tout C'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps Mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Andrew Osborne and Vladimir Soldotkin of Reuters brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Putin said that Russia could have sunk a British warship that it accused of illegally entering its territorial waters without starting World War III and accused Washington of a role in the provocation. Tension between Moscow and London soared last week after Russia challenged the right of the HMS defender to transit waters near Russian annex Crimea, something Britain said it had every right to do. Putin's comments add menace to earlier Russian warnings that Moscow would bomb British naval vessels in the Black Sea in the event of further provocative actions by the British Navy near heavily fortified Crimea. Of course, Russia annexed Crimea illegally from the re- Ukraine in 2014, and Britain and most of the world recognize the Black Sea Peninsula as part of Ukraine, not Russia. Well, 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 that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we're going to meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Fridays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
Je voudrais du soleil vert Des dentelles et des théères Des photos de bord de mer D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais de la lumière Comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre Je veux changer d'atmosphère D'un manche à d'un hiver Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 